This is the Building Automation Monthly Podcast with Phil Zito, episode 93. Hey folks, Phil Zito here, and welcome to episode 93 of the Building Automation Monthly Podcast. And in this podcast, we'll be finishing part two of preventative maintenance and building automation systems. And if you didn't listen to part one, I'll give you a very brief recap of what we covered, but you can go and listen to episode 92 at buildingautomationmonthly.com forward slash 92, and you'll be able to hear everything we discussed in great detail. So when we started in part one, we started with the premise that there's a lot of preventative maintenance tasks that you can do for HVAC. And folks often miss, mix up these tasks with BAS tasks. So they think they're doing BAS maintenance when they're actually doing HVAC maintenance. And we continued that kind of thought process with the belief that there's just not really a good list of building automation system preventative maintenance tasks for whatever reason. And so we came up with a list of eight tasks and I've got a list of eight more that we're going to be discussing in this episode. So last episode, the tasks that we focused on were backing up databases, tuning PI loops, calibrating sensors, verifying control device operations, adjusting schedules, clearing operator overrides, alarm management, naming standards. So you can kind of see that these tasks varied from the inputs, the physical inputs and outputs, all the way to the software and to the actual setup of the system. So everything a little bit in between. And what the key point you really want to take from this is that if you focus in on any one part of the system too much, then you'll miss out on other areas of the system. And when I say the system, I mean the BAS. Because for example, if all I focused on was software and I did graphics and schedules and databases, I would go and miss things like sensors and device operations and operator overrides. And so you really want to be careful whenever you're, I, I've seen this a lot. I've been, you know, guilty of it in the past as well is where you have a strength and you tend to focus on that strength and you tend to avoid the areas that you don't have a strength in so if you're a mechanical person you'll tend to focus on mechanical preventative maintenance tasks well you want to be very careful in bas of doing that because it's not just mechanical it's not just software it's it's not just how the user is operating it it's all three of those things so like I said, in this episode, we're going to be discussing eight more things. So the first thing we're going to talk about is maintaining set points. And this is both a preventative maintenance practice as well as a project closeout slash uh, owner taking possession of a building process as well. Whenever you go and you close out a project or you take possession of a building, you really want to go and log the set points. Now, on some systems, that's as simple as doing a backup of the system, and that'll be just fine. For other systems, you'll actually have to go and write down the set points because they may not be saved in the backup. It just depends on the system, and you need to know that. But once you've done that, then what you really want to do, and this is more of like a once a quarter kind of check, is where you go and you validate the major set points. So your chilled water set point, your discharge air for your air handlers, those kind of set points. Those are the ones that I would validate because you're going to have limited time to do validation quite often. You're just going to be running from fire to fire. And so if you simply hit the systems that are going to go and use up the most BTUs, the most energy, and that are going to get the most wear and tear by not being on set point, then you'll be doing yourself a favor. So for example, if you were to look at a chiller or if you were to look at an air handler and you saw that the discharge air was adjusted way low and you talk to folks and they're saying, oh, well, we had a meeting one day and it had a ton of people in the conference room or in the cafeteria or whatever. And so we turn the set point down, but they never remember to turn it up. That's actually quite common that that happens. And that's why, you know, once a quarter, I mean, ideally you do it once a month, but just making sure that your set points are on target because when a building's designed, it's 
ideally, I'm not going to say this happens all the time, but ideally it's going to be designed with uh, load calculations where they're looking at how many people could be in the space and thus designing the set point accordingly. So that's the first one, maintaining set points. The next one is trend log reviews. So what do I mean by this? Well, first we assume that you have trends and that they're set up at the right intervals. If you don't have that, go back to one of my earlier episodes that I'll link in the show notes where I discuss trends and uh, you can read some blog articles where I discuss trends. But assuming you have trends set up, assuming all of that is configured and that you're measuring the right values, now you want to do trend log reviews because what a trend log review is going to do is it's going to show you real quickly some of the major inefficiencies that you'll find in building automation. Uh, primarily simultaneous heating and cooling, uh, poorly tracking PID loops, uh, economizer control that's overridden or simply doesn't work, um, resets that aren't working. There's a variety of different things, and they're actually quite simple to set up with trend logs. Let's talk through one real quickly how a trend log review would work. Well, what you would do is you would go and you would uh, pull the trends for all of your VAV boxes, and you would look at uh, the points. You'd look at discharge air, heating valve, and cooling valve position. And uh, sorry, I said VAV boxes. I meant to say fan coils there. You'd look at fan coils, or maybe you'd look at rooftops, or you'd look at air handlers. And you'd look for both the heating and the cooling valve being open at the same time. And what that's going to tell you is that's going to indicate potentially simultaneous heating and cooling. It may also indicate just a really poorly designed sequence where you cool down air and then you have a reheat uh, coil downstream from the fan and you're going and reheating the air back up. I mean, that's just bad sequencing, but I digress. So what you do, you pull those points and you can do this like one of two ways, right? If you don't have a lot of systems, then you can simply eyeball it. If you do, you can export it into Excel and then you could write a function that, you know, something like if uh, cooling valve and heating valve are greater than zero, um, make cell red or something like that. And I'm not going to get into Excel basics and stuff. That's something you could easily Google. But essentially what you're doing is you write that macro or you write that equation real quickly. It's And then you just copy and paste that equation or that formula. And then it's going to go and flag all of the simultaneous heating and cooling. Now there's software that will do this. There's, you know, commissioning agent software. There's analytics that will do this. But if you don't have those capabilities, um, maybe your site's too small. Maybe you uh, just simply can't afford it for whatever reason then this is another way you can do that. Now here, this one's going to be a long one um, because there's just so many variables to it, but uh, we're going to try and knock it out. So network checks and software updates. And when I say software updates, I'm primarily talking about patching. So network checks. Well, what do we mean by network checks? Well, I'm going to cover some other network aspects in a second. So specifically when I'm talking about network checks, I'm talking about understanding that your BAS isn't dropping packets. Uh, you know, that's a good network check to work with a network engineer or work with the IT group uh, once a quarter to just make sure that the network you're on, maybe someone decided, hey, oh, this network's got spare IPs. Let's put the 4K IP cameras on it. <laughs> and now all of a sudden that limited bandwidth issue is popping up because you don't have enough network capacity for your BAS and those 4K cameras at the same time. I actually see this quite often because what tends to happen is a BAS will be given its own switch because folks are scared crapless of BAS because they don't really understand it. So they put it on its own switch, its own VLAN, and they're like, oh, well, they're IP cameras. You know, they're kind of a building system. Let's put them on with the BAS. And the next thing you know, BAS is, you know, sometimes you could log on, sometimes you can't. Sometimes the graphics take really long to respond. And before you know it, uh, it's all because of that bandwidth. So some of the things you want to check on network are bandwidth, dropped packets. Um, what are some other really good ones? Let me think about this for a second. So I check uh, drop packets. I check bandwidth. 
I would also check packet size to make sure that stuff's not huge coming through. And I, I can already hear some of your internal thoughts because I used to be at this place where you're at, most likely, where you're like, um, how do I do that? Well, you know, there's a couple ways to do it. I mean, you can use stuff like Wireshark to go do packet analyzing. You can do uh, working with the IT group. They have a variety of different software that you can do. Some BASs will give you statistics on their communication. So it just depends. This is why I tell everyone in the BAS field they really got to learn IT. I mean, it's very rapidly coming to the point where uh, if you don't understand the fundamentals of IT, uh, you're you could be very limited in your BAS career. But that's I've covered that before in other episodes, and that's uh, a whole another can of worms. So those are some basic network checks, right? And I mean, you've obviously got the well, I don't want to say obviously, but I just did. So you, maybe not so obviously, you've also got things like IP addresses. You want to make sure those haven't changed. You want to make sure that you can still communicate with the server. I mean, you'd be shocked how many folks are like, oh, well, we haven't been able to communicate with the server for a year, so we just log into the supervisory devices directly. And you're like, okay, why are you doing that? Well, because we couldn't connect to the server. Well, did you figure out why you couldn't connect to the server? So that's kind of a whole other thing, like I said. And then you've got software updates patching. And this is something that scares a lot of folks. And I've talked in previous episodes about virtual machines and why I'm such a strong advocate of virtual machines. One of the main reasons being patching, because with a virtual machine, you're able to take what's called a snapshot. Basically, it's a picture in time, right? And you basically take a picture of your BAS server, how it's running, and then what happens if you do a patch, which basically a patch is, I mean, Pretty much all of you should know what patches are, right? Um, but if you don't, once again, you really need to learn IT. But essentially, a patch is when someone realizes a bug or a vulnerability in a set of software, so they release a new set of software. They basically fix the vulnerability, and then they uh, send you a new set of software. So when you have a virtual machine and you do a patch, you can actually do it one of two ways. Uh, you can go and actually have the software itself um, patched on a main server in your office, and then you can roll out that version of software as a new, fresh, clean install, and then simply just download the database or upload, depending on your vendor, whatever term they want to use, back to the server and um, call the day. Otherwise, you know, maybe you're an operator and you're trying to do it on your own. Well, you have your software image of your BAS server, and then you just go and simply patch that BAS server. And if something were to crap out, you would just restore the software image. Now, I know for some of you that still sounds very complicated. Um, I'll see if I can link to a couple articles around kind of the virtual machine thing it's it's really not as bad as it sounds i know it's intimidating but uh it's it's not that big of a deal trust me on that so the next thing is checking for unbound references i'm sure we've all seen this where you do a retrofit project and you maybe do some sort of relocation or tenant improvement and the device instance changes and it's all well and good on the supervisory device, but for some reason, whatever, you don't check the graphic and now the graphic's broken. Or even worse, <coughs> excuse me, even worse, what's going on is you go and you get the device instance right, you get a, everything's right and it all should work, but you used maybe a different name for a point and because of that, the graphic, which is um, a template graphic or an alias graphic, that then goes and is looking for that referenced point, but it's a different name, so thus you get an unbound reference. And I, I see this actually happen quite a lot. Um, surprisingly, this happens the most to folks who are kind of in their midpoint in their career. I don't see it happen so much to the new folks because they're kind of paranoid, and the, the older folks have been burnt by this, so they, they check it, but kind of that middle career folks... I see a lot of them kind of rushing through. They're, they're at that prime where everyone's loading them with work because, you know, they've gotten to where they are by performing. 
They still have, feel like they have something to prove, and so they're rushing through these projects. And next thing you know, they get a bunch of unbound references. And you know, the, the how it usually happens is no one checks it until after warranty, and then they're like, "Oh, hey, we need you to come fix this." And now you got to pull off of the job, and you got to eat it because there's no cost. They've already closed out the job. You got nowhere to bill your time, and next thing you know, uh you're just getting yelled at for wasting time. So that's the fourth one. The fifth one is BACnet. Duplicate network IDs, instance numbers, BBMD issues. I mean, the ha uh, where to begin? Everyone's been asking me to do another episode on BACnet lately, and I think I probably will because I did an earlier episode on BACnet, and that just led to even more questions and I'll be honest, some of you are diving a little too deep in the back net. I mean, I, I hate to be the guy who's like, hey, yeah, just let the black box do its magic. But at the same time, there's only so many things you need to have right. So you need to have, so how back net's structured, right? You have back net IP and back net MSTP. And IP is basically a WAN LAN uh, arc protocol. So that means a wide area network or local area network protocol. And MSTP is basically a field bus protocol. Well, what happens is, is for each BACnet network, you have a network ID, and that has to be unique. And then you have instance numbers for your device, and those need to be unique. And what I often see is folks will duplicate network IDs, or they'll duplicate instance numbers for devices, and then they get device conflicts. And BACnet's a lot of things, but what it's not really good at is natively telling you what's wrong. Meaning that it really depends on the manufacturer to implement error codes and things like that for you to figure out what's wrong. And some manufacturers do that quite well, some not so much. And because of that, I, I find a lot of folks with network ID and instance number issues and the network is basically blinking. It's on, it's off, it's on, it's off, or sometimes it's just very flaky, it's very slow, and they can't figure out why. So this would be another good check, especially if you take over a building, or if you start servicing a building, I would really, I would go through and check these things, because chances are you're gonna run into at least some duplicate instance numbers. And also, you know, this goes, I'm, I gotta stop making these statements. I keep going, it goes without saying, or everyone knows. I'm like, no, Phil, everyone doesn't know. But uh, <laughs> it's important to say that the BACnet broadcast management devices, or BBMDs, those need to be set up properly as well. Now, remember, BACnet is a broadcast uh, protocol, meaning that it sends traffic out on all ports of the local area network. And once again, if you don't understand what I'm saying about that, go back and refer to my IT articles or IT episodes that I'll link at the bottom of the show notes. But so BACnet, duplicate network IDs, instance numbers, and BBMDs, as I was saying. So these BBMDs, what they do is they're broadcast management. So essentially these BACnet devices, they want to do who is I am. Those are their ways that they discover what devices exist. Uh, is they send out these who is and I am messages. It's basically like caller ID for BACnet. And what happens is, is that they get broadcast out. Well, if they need to communicate then to another device, they need to go and have a way to route those broadcasts because broadcasts are a layer two thing. They, they don't leave the local network. And in order to travel to another local network, you need a BBMD, which will say, oh, these are all your BACnet uh, networks, and then your BACnet devices will know where to send their broadcasts. Now, that's all well and good, and we've talked about a lot of cool stuff, but how do you go and make sure that your networks are optimized? Because a lot of, you know, uh, I, I struggle with what I'm about to talk about because I understand it. Having come out of the service field, I totally get why folks have 20-year-old building automation systems. 
But on the flip side, having been involved heavily in integration, I also see the value of newer building automation systems. So the reality is that most of the building automation systems you're going to run into, unless you're doing new construction your entire career, are going to be you know, 10 plus years old. Well, what's one of the biggest issues with a 10-year-old building automation system? It's most likely on a 10-year-old network. And you're going to start to go and experience network issues, slow devices, um, just kind of general folks keep adding trends and the trends are just clogging up the pipe, cl clogging up the network capacity. And so this is where you really need to optimize your existing network. So you need to kind of go back to that trend log review, understand what you're trying to achieve, and then optimize how you have things set up. So for example, if you're simply trying to measure a space temperature, and space temperature is what we would call a slow acting loop, a slow acting process. And basically a loop and a process is where you have a set point and you have a process variable. In this case, it'd be space temp would be the process variable, set point would be space temp set point. And your controller looks at those two things and says, oh, space temp is not at set point. <coughs> and what it will do is then it will go, your controller will go and adjust something, typically the air damper to allow more air into the space to either cool the air or l allow less air into the space and turn on reheat to heat the air. Well, if you were to trend that every 30 seconds, that probably wouldn't be a good idea. Likewise, if you were to do change of value trending, that might not be a good idea either. So change of value trending is when the value changes by a certain percent, you go and grab a trend sample, essentially a record. And interval is the other form of training or trending. And that is where you go and you do it on a regular time basis on a series. And what happens is, is a lot of folks will set up, you know, either 15 minute trends for everything and they'll miss a ton of stuff or they'll set up. And then when they miss stuff, they then switch everything to one minute trends and then they just clog their network. Uh, points start updating slowly, all those kind of things. So this is where you really got to find a balance. And the kind of rule of thumb is that if you don't have to trend it more than 15 minutes, don't trend it more than 15 minutes because it's just on older networks, on newer networks, you do whatever the heck you want. They're, all the newer BASs, I won't say all, but most can tolerate very fast trend intervals. I mean, we used to be where you had database capacity issues, but not so much anymore. Hard drive space is cheap. So you really just want to go and kind of, it's something you just kind of learn. I, I wish I could give you settings, but it's just something it's kind of, you learn, you know how you're driving down the road and you can just kind of feel what 55 miles per hour or however many kilometers per hour that would be for some of my European friends. But you could just kind of feel how fast that's, that is after you've been driving for a while. Well, it's kind of the same way. You can kind of feel how fast or, or how much or how little you should be trending. Next up, we have sequence verification. Now, sequence verification is something that should be done quite often. And here's why. Folks go, the HVAC guys go, and they do some maintenance on an air handler, and they change some stuff around. Maybe they change the drive settings for whatever reason, or maybe they go and they take a actuator off while they're working on something and they leave it off. Now, granted, verifying control device operations in the previous episode would grab a lot of this, but sometimes folks don't have time to do that. And so what I recommend at least once every six months is that you go through the sequence on your major units and just make sure no one changed the code, make sure there's no overrides, make sure that all the devices are responding. This is kind of your summer winter check. Basically, you just make sure your sequence is operating as designed. And this is really important. This is something 
I don't see a lot of folks do. And then they wonder why their building is just totally uncomfortable. And, you know, they find out that the condomizer damper has been 100% for the past two years. And that's why they've never been able to hit set point. S stuff that seems like it'd be very simple to check. But folks don't check it or maybe they check it and the outdoor air damper strokes perfectly but they didn't check that someone maybe was trying to make a change to the outdoor air uh, damper reset for co2 control and they flipped the minimum and maximum co2 settings on accident and because they flipped those that then has caused the outdoor air damper to be locked a uh, hundred percent open all the time now, if you were simply to just stroke the damper, you would see that the damper works perfectly fine. But if you actually went and changed the CO2 setting, you'd see that you know, the, the higher the CO2, the more the damper closes, and the lower the CO2, the more the damper opens, and that's not how it's supposed to work. So this is why it's important to do a sequence or functional check versus just going and doing a point and you know, output check. And so for the final tip, and this is going to be the final tip of the episode, and uh, I'll then just recap real quick. But graphic enhancements. Oh my goodness. If there's one area that would have massive impact on just everything, it's graphic enhancements. Because let's be real, the operator... I would say probably 8 out of 10 of them, they spend pretty much all their time in the graphics. They don't really log into the logic. They don't go into the tree. Unless, heck, some of them don't even go to the units. They live in the graphics. So I've seen one of two things tend to happen. I've either seen a minimalist approach where there's almost nothing on the graphic or there's no graphics whatsoever. There's just a building graphic. Or I've seen the kind of over-the-top, you know, I'm going for NASA graphic where they put everything in the kitchen sink on there. You want to try to settle for something in between. First off, you want to use templates as much as possible. You want folks to only have to understand a handful of graphics. And you know how graphics tend to flow is you have a main graphic, a floor plan graphic, a system graphic, and then a space graphic. Those tend to be your four main graphics. And you want those to kind of just flow naturally, that someone could click on the main graphic, oh, see a floor is messed up, click on the floor, oh, see which space is messed up, click on that space, and then realize the system that's feeding that space and click on that system. Ideally, that's how you want folks to flow through, because that's kind of how they think. They're going to get a call from a building saying that this room and that floor is bad, and so they can quickly get to that floor, and then they can check the system that's serving that floor. Now, uh, another kind of tip you can think of around preventative maintenance, obviously making sure that there's no unbound references, stuff's reliable, the graphics are accurate, there actually is a room 101 on your, in your building where your graphic says it is and it's not the floor plan of some other building. Uh, I've seen that a couple times. And also what you really want to do is you want to go and either pick kind of a middle of the road graphic where you don't kind of expose, you should expose set points that control to comfort, like space temp, those kind of things. But there's no reason to expose PI set points, to expose reset set points, those kind of things. There's no reason because if someone is smart enough to be changing reset, then they're smart enough to know how to either log into the logic or to log onto the supervisory device and change it that way versus through the graphic. When you expose it to the graphic, you have no idea who potentially could log on to that BAS and access that graphic. So that then brings me to my second point. You can have graphics that have everything on them. You just need to then go and have multiple graphics. You'd have a graphic that is for the mechanic you'd have a graphic that's for the bas tech a graphic that's for the facility operator or the maintenance guy and this would then allow you to go and put the right points put the right systems on the graphics that only that person needs to know now that becomes a administrative nightmare because 
you have to maintain three sets of graphics instead of one, but that's one way to do it. That's why I kind of tend to prefer the middle of the road. Don't expose anything that could cause harm. Uh, go and simply make it to where folks can access what they need on the graphics, and if they need to dive deeper, they know how to get in the system. And if they know how to get in the system, then most likely they know what they're doing. All right, so let's recap on these kind of 16 preventative maintenance actions that we discussed. So you got backing up databases and tuning PI loops, calibrating sensors and verifying control device operations, adjusting schedules, clearing operator overrides, alarm management, and naming standards. And that was all in the previous episode, episode 92. And in this episode, we went through maintaining set points, trend log reviews, network checks and software updates. And when I say software updates, like I said, I mean patching checking for unbound references, BACnet, and duplicate network IDs, BBMDs, instance numbers, optimizing existing networks, COV versus internal trends, kind of getting that all working well, sequence verification, and why that's important to rely on that and not just verifying a control device operation, and graphics enhancements. So I know this was a lot to take in, and for some of you, these concepts are very new. For some of you, these concepts are something that you've mastered over the years. If all of this is new, then I'd really encourage you to check out my new course, Building Automation System Fundamentals. And I'm going to take you cradle to grave through what a building automation system is. So this course is ideal for a building operator or for a technician or for someone who really wants to understand all the parts and pieces of a BAS, how they work, uh, how different things are controlled, and those kind of topics. It's going to really quickly get you up to speed on building automation. And it's what I wish I had back when I started in the building automation field, because it would have at least shaved off six months of a learning curve, because it just... Uh, there's a lot to know. Let's just say that. There's a lot to know about building automation systems. So with that being said, everything I discussed can be found at buildingautomationmonthly.com forward slash 93. Once again, that is buildingautomationmonthly.com forward slash 93. And I look forward to seeing your comments. If this episode was helpful, then my only ask is that you share it with your coworkers and customers so that they too can learn how to perform preventative maintenance on their building automation system. Thanks a ton, and I'll talk to you all next week. Take care.